Masha, it's great to see you. It's wonderful to have you uh, here in Chicago with us. Uh, you've, you've gone through an incredible journey just in the last few years, but uh, I don't want to have spent a lot of time in the last few years. I really want to talk about the journey that you've described in your book. And then we end up with where we are today in, in Ukraine. But let me ask as the first question, where you start your book. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the first line is, I knew it was over. Mm -hmm. um, tell us about that day in, in March of 2019, when you realized that the worst that can possibly happen to an ambassador being recalled back to Washington was happening for you. Yeah. What was that like? Well, that's certainly not anything that I had imagined would happen to me. Uh, so uh, this was in March of 2019, and there had been, you know, all these whispers and rumors and innuendos that um, Ukrainians, Americans wanted me out of the job. Uh, but when I would call back to Washington, my part of Washington, sort of the career people at the State Department and at the NSC and the White House, um, you know, I was assured that there was no desire to recall me, that I was doing a fine job, I was implementing the policy. But of course, I wasn't talking to people like Rudy Giuliani, the <laughs> president's um, personal attorney, and the person who was working with Ukrainians to, you know, dig up dirt on uh, Joe Biden, but also to get me uh, removed. So in in March of 2019, um, all of a sudden the whispers became, you know, loud shouts. There were a series of articles in a Washington online newspaper called The Hill, which is a very reputable newspaper. And it, um, a, a journalist, an American journalist, had done a, uh, an interview with um, the um, prosecutor general, a guy named Vitsenko, who was a very corrupt man, um, and didn't like that the US government, including, of course, me, was pushing to, for, uh, you know, uh, to make his office more uh, transparent and um, more in line with um, the, the policy, not only the US, but of Ukraine itself, which was trying to become less, less corrupt. So the two of them were working together, Giuliani and Lutsenko. Lutsenko um, did, did, did um, an interview with the Hill, and in that he made all sorts of allegations against me. So this appeared in the United States, and all of a sudden it was everywhere. It was on Fox News, it was on all sorts of cable shows, it was um, you know, online in, in various places on Twitter. Um, President Trump himself, the following day, retweeted one of the articles, and then, you know, over the weekend, things were just getting worse. Um, sort of the, the real <laughs> bad moment was when Donald Trump Jr. on a Sunday tweeted, you know, we need to get rid of, um, you know, people like Ambassador Yanovich, and so that was that was, you know, it was clear I was not going to last unless the State Department really. Um, and Secretary Pompeo himself, because it had to have political heft. This was obviously not um, not uh, not a not something uh, career people could 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 do. It had to be somebody who had heft with uh, President Trump. So um, on that Saturday, the day before the um, Donald Trump Jr. Uh, tweet, I uh, called back to the department and said, "You've got to come out and defend me, and, and you know, please have it be uh, Secretary Pompeo." And instead, what happened, it, so what they said is, well, yeah, um, you know, it's Saturday, we'll talk to the boss on, on Monday and see, um, see what we can do. But in the meantime, you put out your own defense. And what you should do is you should um, indicate your loyalty to the president and to the Constitution. And that, to me, felt like a loyalty pledge. And that is not something that Americans do. I mean, all of us swear allegiance to the flag. Individuals. I mean, that's in part why we fought the Revolutionary War all those years ago. And so um, that was not something I could do. I, 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 I put something else out because presidential elections in Ukraine were coming out. And so I talked about the importance of free and fair elections and the importance because we were not sure. It was clear that Zelensky was going to win. Um, and we weren't sure that Poroshenko was going to accept the results of that election. And so I put in there that, you know, it's a hallmark of a democracy to accept the results of elections. <laughs> <laughs> and 
not knowing that actually the Ukrainians would do far better in this respect than we are selling. And that is a very sad commentary. So that was, you know, sort of that, those five or six days where I felt, you know, that I, without political support from my own government, since this was coming from parts of, uh, or those associated with my own government, that I couldn't really last. But I felt that I had to do everything I could um, to, uh, to, to fight it. Uh, not that there was a whole lot I could do without the support of the Secretary of State or the President. Um, but I felt I had to because this was sending really bad signals to Ukrainians, to other bad actors around the world, to other autocrats, that you know, if they didn't like U.S. policy, maybe they could just get rid of that pesky ambassador, you know, cut, cut some kind of a deal. And um, I felt that that was just really, really a bad precedent. And so I did what I could, ultimately, of course, unsuccessfully, uh, to try to fight back a little bit. So, what, what do you think was the motivation? Was it coming from the United States, or were there also people in Ukraine who really thought they could use the, the, the forces in the United States to get rid of it? Yeah. Was it both? Was it one or the yeah, other? Yeah, I, I think there were a confluence of events, and I think that we actually, you know, I mean, every week it seems there's a new Trump book out, and every week we find out more things, right? And so I, I think that even in, you know, the, the footnote of history, which, uh, with regard to me, I think we're going fi <clears> to <throat> find out more things. But clearly, I think Lutsenko had a personal axe to grind. I think President Poroshenko, um, who was very aware of this, uh, and this would not have happened without his tacit approval, um, I think he was hoping that if he curried favor with President Trump, that he could get an endorsement of his presidency. I mean, he was very open about wanting that. Uh, and I think, you know, there were some energy interests around um, that were also, um, you know, they didn't like what the U.S. was doing in Ukraine because we were supporting the reforms in the gas, um, the, the gas monopoly that was owned by the government. I mean, it was incredible the work that they were doing and we were supporting that and they didn't like that. So there were a lot of interests at work. And then on the U.S. side, um, I think that, um, you know, clearly Giuliani was uh, digging around for dirt um, with regard to the Biden family, and also looking to reinforce, um, you know, this myth that you know it wasn't about Russia intervention in the 2016 elections; it was Ukraine. And so I think there were multiple reasons on, um, you know, on the U.S. side as well. Just an interesting footnote on, on, on that latter point. I think uh, Donald Trump learned put that in quotation marks, um, <laughs> that it was Ukraine rather than Russia that had defeated the 2016 election from Vladimir Putin and his meeting yeah. in Helsinki. Yeah. Yeah. The same one where in the press conference the president said he believed the president, the president, the former guy, um, uh, said he believes President Putin more than his own intelligence. Mm -hmm. Anyway, let's not go there. I want to, I, because that's what they want us to go. <laughs> But there's, there's so much more. Um, I wanted to start with this. Um, I, I wanted to start with this because it really wasn't the end that you had thought would happen if you look back at your career, and I want to spend time looking back at your mm -hmm. career. 33 years in the Foreign Service. Mm -hmm. Three-time ambassador. Mm -hmm. That's remarkable for any Foreign Service officer. It's an exceptional career uh, that, that that you've had. So I want to talk a little bit about that. What what do you what do you attribute that success to? Well, I I, I guess I attribute it to many different. You know, as always, it's many different things. I mean, first and foremost, I think um, my, my parents get the credit because they um, you know they just brought us up. They were immigrants to the United States. They'd grown up in World War II uh, in. Um, Yugoslavia, my father's case, Germany, my mother's, endured all sorts of um, all sorts of hardships, as as you can imagine, and finally found their um, their way to the United States. And they were just so grateful uh, that they had a place of refuge here in the U.S. They were so grateful for the freedoms they had because they knew what it was to live under an autocrat in an autocracy. 
And they kind of brought us up to value that and to understand how lucky we were, we, we were my brother and I, to have the opportunities that we had. Um, not only the, um, you know, the economic opportunities, but uh, just the ability to worship as you please, the ability to say what you want and not get into trouble for it. Um, I mean, these were all things that my parents never took for granted. And um, so we were brought up with that, but we were also told that we were really fortunate. And so we had to work hard um, and that we had to give back. My parents were teachers uh, for most of their uh, lives, and they not only you know, taught generations of students in the classroom, but they also taught them outside of the classroom. You know, the, the valuable lessons of life that, that you get from adults uh, around you. And um, so I think both my brother and I kind of felt that we needed to somehow give back as well. And of course, you can do that in so many different ways. I love, you know, history and politics and travel and all these things. And so I kind of married up that um, idea of giving back to the American people um, with my passion of, um, you know, with history and politics. And, and so the Foreign Service, um, you served in Somalia, you served in the United Kingdom, you served in Uzbekistan, you served in Russia, in Kyrgyzstan, of course in Ukraine, mm -hmm. Armenia, yes. mostly the former Soviet Union. Um, what was the worst assignment? <laughs> well, usually people ask me what, what, what's the best assignment, which That's is your why. favorite country. <laughs> but I'm going to give you the same answer and you're going to be disappointed. <laughs> which is, you know, it's like children. You never name a favorite. <laughs> and you never name the worst. Um, but there were certainly a lot of adventures along the way. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's, let's go to Somalia because you didn't really have a good time there. You were about to leave. Yeah, uh, the your, 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 first, your first assignment was early in, in the mid-80s. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it, wasn't, it was a hard assignment. It's a hard country, but it was harder because of the people you were working with and the country you were serving. Yeah. So talk a little bit about the obstacles that you faced, both as, both as a woman in the Foreign Service. Mm -hmm. uh, and the 1980s, it wasn't great to be a woman in the Foreign Service. By the way, it's better now, but it's still not. Uh, where you would want it to be, but because of people like you, it is much better. So talk a little bit about the obstacles you faced, also whether you had people who helped you advance in the career, which is so important in every career that you have, but particularly in the foreign service, yeah. and those who didn't care. Yeah, yeah. And actually, you know, in answer to the previous question, I, I should have said that, um, you know, I had mentors, not formal mentors, but people along the way that were looking out for me and, you know, gave me particular assignments that they thought I would do well at, that enable you to shine, that, you know, paves the way to the next assignment. Um, they would promote me and, and, um, and so I think that um, that, you know, the, the people you meet along the way that help you, I mean, obviously they, they play a huge role in your career. And the other thing is, is actually, and I'm always told, oh, you're a woman, so you say this, but it's actually true. I was lucky, and here's how I was lucky. I had um, learned Russian um, in, in university and spoke Russian, had an early assignment in, 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 in early assignments actually in, in, in Moscow. And all of a sudden in 1991, the Soviet Union falls apart. And so instead of having you know, just one embassy in Moscow, all of a sudden you know, there are 15 embassies, all of which um, at that time we were looking for Russian speakers, all of which needed um, you know, Russian-speaking ambassadors, people that knew the region and so forth. And so I was coming up during that time. And so, again, I had kind of the right skill set for people to promote me. I mean, it was, you know, I mean, I worked hard and everything else, but it was also a lucky confluence uh, for me in, in that respect. So here's what wasn't a lucky confluence of events. Somalia, my very first tour. So I was, I had been working in Manhattan um, in the 1980s in advertising and marketing and decided that this was not completely fulfilling for me, so I joined the Foreign Service. So where do I go? I go to Somalia, which, you know, is pretty close to the end of the world. I mean, it is, it is very, very remote. And this was in 1986 when I went out there. And so it's before, um, before cell phones, before the internet and all of that, right? So I communicated with family and friends by letter which took three months round trip. I didn't have a telephone, and so I would you know, go to the embassy and make an appointment 
to uh, make international calls, and it was kind of so arduous that I didn't do it very often. Um, so it was very remote. It was very far away from anything I had ever known. And, you know, but I was up for the adventure, but it was uh, perhaps more adventure than I had, uh, than I had bargained for. I was doing um, management work, administrative work, embassies um, in countries like Somalia, countries like Afghanistan, are their own little cities because there are no services in these countries. And, and you know, we are Americans and we need all sorts of things um, like electricity, like water, running water, <laughs> like garbage collection. And so these were the things that I was responsible for in, uh, in Mogadishu. And it was very, very difficult for any number of reasons you can, you can probably imagine. But also, um, I, I was supposed to, you know, pull, uh, pull things um, I was responsible for shipments to and from the United States. Uh, we were building a new embassy at the time, and so we were getting a lot of, um, a lot of construction materials through the port. And the port um, decided that they were going to charge us you know, X times over the usual amount. And so getting that decision, and so obviously this was going to go into the pockets not just of the people at the port, but the ministers and ultimately the presidency at Bari, because this is a country that was rife with corruption. And um, so we had this blockade at the port for, for months, and I arrived. Um, I mean, this was not in my, um, you know, at my level. I wasn't going to be able to negotiate the solution. Um, that was for uh, the, the charge, the, the, the man who was running the embassy in the absence of an ambassador. And, um, but then it was like, okay, Masha, get this done. But for whatever reason, either people were looking to shake us down some more, or they didn't get the memo, or whatever, nothing was happening at the port. And so for quite a while, I had to like sort of beat down the doors to make that happen, so that we could get our, um, our, our things, our effects, at the, um, at the you know, fair market price. <laughs> so that was my first introduction to sort of um, you know, big time corruption that was kind of sponsored by the government and how difficult it was to deal with it because everybody was getting a cut. You know, the, the bribes would be paid to the people at the port, but they would, you know, send it up to their boss who sends it up to their boss who sends it up to their boss. Everybody taking a little cut along the way. And I don't know what they called it in Somalia, but, you know, when I um, started working in the former Soviet Union, it was called patok, or in Ukrainian, patik. Uh, which means the stream, you know, the stream of revenue going up to the top, going up to the leadership. So that was a real challenge and a little um, disillusioning for you know, this really uh, idealistic young foreign service officer who wants to make the world a better place. And um, the other interesting thing that I only noted really, um, because at the time I didn't have a context to think about these things, but I noted this when I was writing the book, the pattern of corruption in many of the places that I served. I wasn't thinking about it like that when I was in Somalia. I mean, it was just the way it was. And the US government also wasn't taking that on as an issue in any way, at least so far as I know. Because I think we were so concerned about our security relationship with Somalia during the Cold War. It was an important posting because Ethiopia was with the Soviets, and so we wanted our, our our outpost. We also had signals, communications, because of the strategic location of Somalia. We had a lot of reasons to want a strong relationship with Siad Barre. But the corruption really undermined his own position in the country. And ultimately, of course, the, uh, the Somali people got rid of him, um, partly because of his, his, his corruption. And you can see what's ensued ever since. Um, it really, uh, really, really disappointing in many ways. So I'm re-watching The Sopranos, and I'm really learning about corruption that way. Uh, and that upward stream. Um, yeah. But it's interesting, actually, uh, corruption, just, just as a side note, it is the common theme in, in almost everywhere you've served. Uh, and yet, I don't think that in the 30 years or 35 years since the beginning you started, we've actually had a really good policy on corruption. We do it one by one, so we deal with corruption in Ukraine, and we deal with corruption in Somalia, and, and then make, or but don't, we don't, yeah. or, or don't, uh, but we don't really have a policy that says this is how you deal with corruption, should we? Well, I actually think the Biden administration is trying, trying to tackle that. 
Uh, and you know, they put out a white paper, I, I think back in December, November or December, about this very issue, you know, setting up a committee, I'm sure, and various other things. I think it's a start. Um, and so that, that is a good thing because um, I, I, I think we need to become more aware about not only the corruption in other countries, but um, you know, perhaps the corruption that exists in our country, but certainly also <laughs> the fact that um, we enable corruption in other countries through our banking systems and through other systems. Um, you know, this has been, I think, much more publicized with regard to, to London and the city in London and how there, you know, are, you know, banks that basically, um, you know, I'm sure on paper they are doing nothing illegal, but basically they are facilitating money laundering for oligarchs in Russia, Ukraine, and other places. There are real estate agents that are taking, you know, millions of pounds in cash I mean, that doesn't make you wonder <laughs> um, for, you know, these fabulous, uh, you know, homes in the center of, of London. And the list goes on. And, um, you know, I think we, you know, need to look within. I mean, yes, we can shake our fingers at other, our finger at other countries to say, you know, this is, you know, this is money that belongs to the people and you need to reinvest in your country, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But we also need to make it much harder here in the U.S., in London and other places um, for uh, for these folks to, to money launder. I mean, period, paragraph. No, absolutely. Uh, uh, and, and, and you write about that in, in your conclusion uh, as one of the big things that need to be done. We're yeah. going to get to Ukraine. Can, can I just but, add one yes. other thing? Sorry. To no, interrupt. please. Yeah. So one of the things that, um, you know, perhaps uh, many in this audience know, but one of the things that is so insidious about Russia is that it uses corruption, and sometimes it's legal, but it uses um, corruption to, um, to undermine other countries. So you look at um, countries where Russia has a relationship, and they will put the leaders, former leaders, um, on boards uh, of you know, their gas companies, on other things. They're getting millions of dollars a year. That is completely legal. Um, but when you have a former chancellor of Germany on Gazprom uh, you know, lobbying for uh, Nord Stream 2, which is that gas pipeline we've been hearing so much about from Russia to Europe, um, you know, is, is he still acting in Germans, Germany's interests and Europe's interests, or is he acting in Russia's interests and, um, and in um, Gazprom's interests? And I think what we're seeing is that the U.S. was right all along. This was a political project. It was not an economic project. It was not an energy project. It was a way to undermine Europe and um, uh, make sure that there will be cracks in European unity. And it's been very successful, hopefully, until now. But we'll see. We'll have to see. I think uh, um, Mr. Schroeder has a lot to answer. He does. Uh, himself for. Uh, as a former chancellor, you would hope that they actually wouldn't jump yes. on uh, a board. Uh, there's other ways to make money uh, than, than that way. Maybe not in Germany, but actually, I think there's other ways to make money in Germany, too. Even in Germany. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, the Ukraine crisis that everybody is watching uh, unfold, uh, in, it really starts in some ways in 1991, when the Soviet Union breaks up, and, 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 and you live that entire period in, in the former Soviet Union, starting in 1991, as you mentioned, uh, being a Russian speaker, all of a sudden having to go to, I think it's Uzbe Uzbekistan, mm -hmm. uh, to, to serve in, in an embassy that all of a sudden had to be created out of, out of nothing. Um, describe what it felt like being in, in Uzbekistan, in Moscow, in these early months of the collapse of the Soviet Union and the sense of possibility uh, that existed. And then, of course, in 1993, you finally get the posting you've always wanted uh, to be a political officer in, in Moscow and spend three years, really hard, difficult years, uh, under under Yeltsin, what was your sense of those years of the possibility with regard to Russia's and the former Soviet space's evolution? Was democracy and economic prosperity um, possible? What were what what was happening uh, at the time in, yeah. in this period? And particularly for the younger ones uh, in the audience, they may not remember uh, that period, which which. Uh, 
was both violent and extraordinarily promising all at the yeah. same time. Yeah. So, um, I, you know, that word possibility, uh, I think, is, is the right one to describe it because I had grown up, I mean, my whole life uh, was um, in the shadow of the Cold War, right? I, I'm sure many other people remember uh, what that was like. Um, and uh, all of a sudden, I mean, many antecedents, but all of a sudden, the Soviet Union breaks apart. There are all these countries, and it just seemed like there were so many possibilities. And uh, many of these countries, including Russia, asked for our assistance um, to help them develop into democracies and market economies. And I don't think any of those leaders <laughs> knew what that meant. Um, because, you know, they had come up through the Soviet system. They were all communists or had been communists until all of a sudden they weren't. And um, so they didn't quite understand what the concepts were and they didn't understand what it would entail to make that transition and how hard it would be. I mean, this is not something that happens like turning on a switch. You know, it is, it is the work of probably generations. And, um, you know, when... So, yeah, so it was... Um, I'm sure there were many discussions in Washington as to what, what should we do, but I think we were all in pretty quickly um, because we wanted to help these countries become stable, prosperous, uh, hopefully democratic countries. That would be good you know, for the neighborhood, but it would also be good for us because democracies, stable countries, uh, countries where there are uh, opportunities for business, those are good partners for the United States. So we saw possibilities, you know, a, a real win-win. But the thing is, what, what, what ended up happening is a lot of reforms happened very quickly. Um, there weren't any um, underlying regulations and laws to sort of support the emergence of uh, a market economy. And so, uh, you know, ruthless businessmen, mafiosi types, the, the, the security services, people who knew where the money was and understood how to game the system, when all of a sudden, um, Russia, Ukraine, other countries put forward um, this, uh, this uh, program to sell off some of the country's um, properties and businesses because everything had been owned by the state before. There was no such thing as a private company in, in the Soviet Union. And so um, every citizen got shares in, in company. But, you know, if you're a little babushka in Russia, um, and, you know, it's been very difficult because the ruble has fallen and you've lost much of your savings and everything else. You're handed a piece of paper and you're told, you, you know, you can use this to buy a share in a factory. You have no idea what that means. And so, totally legally, um, people who did understand what that could mean scooped it all up, um, scooped up all those shares, and they started accumulating the wealth of Russia for themselves in a way that was legal, but um, arguably immoral. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, it kind of went on uh, from there. And ordinary Russians who were suffering through this transition as, um, as you know, the, the laws and the regulations were put in place to protect people, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that all takes time. And then there's the implementation, and that takes time too. And people, you know, by about the time I arrived, they were like ready for this to be over. And so it was a very volatile um, situation. And uh, when I arrived in August of um, uh, 1993, and President Yeltsin, who was trying to push through reforms, um, and uh, the old guard in the Russian Duma, the parliament there, and I call the old guard, you know, so, uh, kind of a combination of communists and nationalists and you know, other, other oddballs, um, they had a lot to work with. There was a lot of dissatisfaction in Russia and um, this confrontation just kept on building until President um, uh, uh, Yeltsin fired his vice president, which arguably, according to the con Russian constitution, he, he didn't have the power to do. The, the parliament took his side and it went on and on and on. And finally, the parliamentarians occupied um, the, the parliament and the Russian, Yeltsin sent troops to encircle uh, the area around the parliament. And it turns out that the U.S. Embassy is in that area. So we have a cordon uh, around us and, you know, some other apartment buildings, a church, um, as well as the, the, the Russian parliament building. And, you know, at first 
it was you know a couple of young policemen that were at the at the checkpoint before I went uh, into work in the morning, and then it was um, you know people who looked a little bit older and asked to see ID and stuff like that, and you know and then it was what I call the hard men. I mean people you do not want to mess with, with um, you know the the full riot gear and uh, armed and everything else. And we were still going back and forth to work because you know what else what else are you going to do? And then. Um, and then, all of a sudden, there was a confrontation. It happened on a Sunday, um, Sunday afternoon where um, the crowd tried to attack the mayors. Um, the, 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 the Duma crowd, the parliamentary crowd, um, was, was given orders by the hardliners to attack the mayor's office that was close by and to try to take the radio and television tower, the Estancano Tower. And so over, um, uh, you know, on this Sunday, there was pretty massive violence, including all around the embassy. And I was told to go to the ambassador's house, which was outside of that embassy cordon, to, um, to you know, set up a, an alternative embassy in case our embassy um, was overrun or something, you know, really dreadful happened. And it was um, really an out-of-body experience, I have to say, because, um, I spent that night, that Sunday night, um, at uh, Spasso House, the very elegant residence of the American ambassador in Moscow. And in the morning, uh, I was uh, on a balcony looking, uh, looking towards uh, the embassy and the parliamentary building, and I could feel the whole building shake because um, Yeltsin had ordered the, um, the uh, Russian army to fire uh, artillery rounds against the uh, his own parliament. Pretty shocking. And uh, so, I, I don't know, is my mic still working? So, you know, what we're going to do is like increase the suspense. <laughs> so we were, um, can somebody help me? Oh, well, maybe that's what I need to do. I, uh, maybe I was just sitting on the mic or something. So, uh, so that was a commercial interruption. <laughs> um, and what we ended up doing uh, was we were told that we had to go down, down, down into the basement. And so there I was sitting with, thank you, is this better? Um, down into the basement. So there we were, there were about, I don't know, eight to ten of us. Um, sitting in the ambassador's basement where he kept all of his canned goods uh, and I was sitting there and I could look out the windows and we could see uh, armed men running back and forth across the embassy lawn and then one of those armed men with a long gun uh, jumped into the window well I mean he was hiding from the others and it wasn't as though we were the targets but it was clearly a dangerous place to be so we go running upstairs and, um, and then the most surreal thing happened, which was that the ambassador's uh, very, very capable chef came upstairs with a pasta dish for us. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so we had one of the best meals I had, I'd had in Moscow <laughs> upstairs while there were armed men running around the, um, the lawn. Uh, and it was just, it was, it was so bizarre. And what was also bizarre is that we Americans were upstairs, whereas the Russian staff was downstairs continuing to do its job. There were so many things that were wrong with that picture. Um, but uh, in the end, um, you know, fortunately, we were not, of course, the targets. And w um, I ended up going over um, you know, back to the embassy to help out with reporting and everything else. But it was, it was a very violent time, as you say. And while Yeltsin prevailed um, during that time, he took a lot of liberties with the Russian constitution. And the Russian people did not forget that. And in the end, there were elections and a new, um, and there was a referendum on a new constitution several months later. So one could argue, and I think the United States argued, that in the end, democracy kind of prevailed and the Russian people had their say. But those who were opposed never forgot this. And, and I don't think they forgot that we didn't condemn this. We didn't criticize Yeltsin. And um, uh, I think that you know, that was in the zeitgeist as um, the 1990s continued. And then ultimately, a man named Vladimir Putin came to power. 
And you know, when I look back at that period, again, I was so junior, I don't know what all the conversations were and everything else. Um, so you had Yeltsin, a man who uh, you know, wanted reforms for his country, wanted a strong relationship with the United States, was a very good partner with us on a number of issues, including crucially, the nuclear issue, because one of the, our biggest concerns when the Soviet Union fell apart was you know, the issue of new, loose nukes, um, nuclear weapons in a number of different countries that you know, probably couldn't uh, keep them safely, couldn't keep them maintained, because that is a lot of money to maintain those kinds of weapons. And so we saw real, uh, real threat, uh, you know, not only to those countries, but you know, to the rest of the world, including the United States. And Yeltsin was a great partner with, for us on that as well. And on the other side, it was this combination of communists and nationalists that wanted to go back to the Soviet Union, which we didn't think was good for the Russians, um, nor certainly for the West and the United States. And so, you know, what do you do? I mean, I think sometimes we think that foreign policy is about, you know, the clear good choice and the clear bad choice, and you know, why doesn't the president pick the clear good choice? And it's usually about you know, shades of gray and trying to pick the least bad option and trying to mitigate risk and um, move forward as we can, even with imperfect knowledge. And of course, you know a lot about that as well from your diplomatic career. Shorter than, than <laughs> yours. Um, powerful, but short, uh, nevertheless. Let's, let's jump. Let's jump to today. Um, how surprised were you that we are having a war in the middle of Europe in which Vladimir Putin decides to invade a neighbor called Ukraine? So um, can, I, can I say both surprised and not surprised? Yeah, no, you, you. So when I was in uh, Ukraine, uh, that was from 2016 to 2019. So two years prior to my arrival, Russia had illegally annexed Crimea and then um, started a war in the Donbass in the east of Ukraine. And um, I think that he stopped at a certain point because we levied sanctions against uh, Russia. And I think that surprised him and he wasn't ready for it. And so he stopped uh, and um, kind of consolidated what he had there. Although over the next eight years, there was a hot war in the middle of Europe. It didn't usually make headlines in the United States, but every week, two to three Ukrainians, civilians and soldiers would die over, over an eight year period. I mean, that's not insignificant. And I thought that that kind of low level, I mean, relatively low level, although you know, three deaths is a lot, uh, that that low level of uh, hostilities, you know, kind of ratcheting it up and down, keeping Ukraine off kilter and destabilizing it, along with the assassination, um, the assassinations in the middle of um, Kyiv, the cyber attacks that caused billions of dollars worth of damage, not just in Ukraine, but in the West as well. Um, the disinformation, I mean, the list goes on for how Russia was trying to destabilize Ukraine. And I thought that that would be enough for Russia. Um, but you know, when we started seeing in the fall of um, 2021, when we started seeing the encirclement of Ukraine, um, then it became clear to me, and if it wasn't clear to me, the intel was released, um, that this was Vladimir Putin's intention to invade Ukraine. Um, and as you know, there was a debate um, in, in the world, and certainly in Ukraine, as to whether or not um, the Russians really would invade, or whether this was just, you know, trying to impress the Ukrainians, trying to scare them into doing something. But it seemed pretty clear to me that there was going to be an invasion, and in fact, of course, uh, of course, there was. So, look, looking back, um, was this <coughs> inevitable? Was this something that, because of the debate that you described in Russia, between? let's call it the Democrats and the, and the, the new guard and the old guard, mm -hmm. uh, and the old guard having at first lost but then really gained power in, in 2000 when Vladimir Putin came to power and consolidated power over the next 10 plus years, 20 plus years really, um, that this was just the way this was gonna end, one form or another. Uh, or were there mistakes made in Ukraine, uh, in Russia, by the United States, by the Western allies that could have led to a different path? 
Yeah. Were we always on one road, or was this a road with lots of turns that could have gone a different way? Yeah. How should we think about this? So uh, I, I, I don't think it was inevitable. Um, I think we in the U.S. Uh, tried really hard to reach out a hand um, to Yeltsin and then to Putin. Uh, we um, not only did the lion's share of any assistance, um, any attention of our national leaders. I mean, when I was there, we had a summit a year with Russia, which, which means the President of the United States. We had, um, you know, full meetings of both cabinets. Um, it, was, it was pretty impressive, the attention that the U.S. paid uh, to Russia, trying to bring it into the international community so that Russia and Russians would understand that it was better to be part of the international community, that this would redound to their benefit over time than to be you know, off, off on the side making trouble. And uh, you know, I, I look back and President Clinton decided uh, and convinced others that the G7, um, you know, the seven largest, the group of seven largest economies in the world, should be expanded to the G8 to include Russia. Although the Russian economy was certainly not the eighth largest economy, um, but it was it was a signal to the Russians that we wanted them in. We wanted them to be constructive uh, citizens on the world stage. Uh, you know, I think of the founding act, the NATO founding act between uh, uh, NATO and and Russia, which was a special organization um, that would kind of make sure that there was a strong relationship uh, with uh, between NATO and Russia and there were at least um, annual meetings, and it was quite constructive in those early years, and even in the early years of, um, of President Putin. And hard as it is to imagine today, but back then some people were talking about the possibility of eventually Russia joining NATO. You know, so it was a very different mindset, and it was not the, um, you know, so I, I look at what Putin puts out about, um, you know, what the US and NATO were doing, I think we were actually trying to bring them in. Um, and, you know, it takes two. And this is the other thing that I am sure that the US made uh, mistakes along the way, but Russia has agency too. Russia can make its own decisions and they can be constructive decisions. I mean, we can see them making decisions now, they're not good decisions, but they can make constructive decisions and join, you know, the family of of uh, you know international countries that are good citizens and so forth. So I think um, you know when I look back, we we tried very hard. Um, I think you know we were making some headway in in the 1990s, and then Putin came in, and I think you know this is where you start wondering whether it was inevitable. Was this the man he always was? Um, the man we see now, uh, is, is this the man he always was? And I'm increasingly coming to the belief that, yes, that is the case. He just accumulated more and more power and was able to actually, you know, live out his fantasies in, in, in a way. And so, you know, from the very earliest years, he stamped out any kind of opposition that was um, possible in Russia, starting with the oligarchs, so they just became you know, in Russia, they call them his wallets. We just call them his money launderers. They have no influence. And then, you know, he went after the opposition, neutering them or, um, in some cases, killing them. But they did not become, uh, they, they were not really independent voices. The press, I mean, there was a free press in, in, in Russia in, in the year 2000. But over time, in the last, 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 um, one just went under in February, uh, well, actually closed itself, hoping that one day it will be able to come back. Um, the free press is, is gone in Russia. Civil society stamped out. Those brave demonstrators hauled off to jail, looking at 15-year terms if they, you know, paint their uh, fingernails <laughs> yellow and blue, if they say the word war. I mean, this is a repressive society now. It is, um, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's back to the USSR in, in many different ways, and it is really, really unfortunate. I think that Putin um, and, you know, those around him have a particular view of history, which is flawed, and it is, you know, what you guys know, what, what he has told us, which is that the Ukrainians are little Russians, as he calls them, that Ukraine is, is not its own country, even though the state of Russia in various treaties and agreements since 1991 has recognized the Ukrainian state. Um, but his belief is that it was a false construct of the Soviet Union 
and um, that it doesn't deserve to exist. And he wants to gather it up back into you know, the fold of Mother Russia. And on the eve of the, election, of, of the uh, invasion, he also told us that he has his eyes on other countries as well. And so I think, um, I think that he, you know, when we look back at his writings and his remarks over the early 2000s and later on, I think we can see it. And when we look back at his actions, so, you know, the Chechen war, uh, two Chechens, Chechen wars in 1999-2000, uh, um, Putin was the prime minister, sort of the anointed heir uh, of um, Yeltsin, and he promulgated this brutal, brutal war in Chechnya, a part of Russia. And again, as far as I know, we didn't say boo about that. And then, you know, fast forward to Georgia, a former Soviet republic, an independent country now. And in 2008, Russia grabbed two chunks of, of, um, of uh, Georgia. And we, we did condemn it, but we didn't take any other action. There weren't even sanctions that were imposed. So, you know, if you're a man like Putin, a bully who, in my opinion, only understands strength, you're thinking, okay, I can do this. And so 2014, Ukraine, and the international community did rally. I mean, they did condemn it. They kicked Putin out of the G8, now it's the G7 again and um, put in sanctions, which I think were effective in stopping Putin. You know, I think he probably would have gone further if, if, if not for those sanctions. But I think he's used the past eight years to amass this big uh, war chest to, you know, not so successfully, but to try to modernize his military. Thankfully, it was not so successful as we've seen and to just get ready, and then he waited for the right moment, and I think this was the moment that he chose to, um, to I think, cement his legacy and bring back to Russia what he believes it is owed. You know Ukraine extremely well. You served there in, in, in the beginning of the 2000s uh, when the first revolution, the Orange Revolution happened. You again, of course, served there from 16 to 19. Um, how, uh, how could Putin have misread the Ukrainian people as badly as he did? Yeah. Well, and I don't think it's just Putin. I think it must be, you know, those around him as well. I think, um, first of all, he's an authoritarian leader, and he's been in power for over 20 years. That's a long time to basically um, be told, you know, you are so smart, you are, uh, you know, never make a mistake, and you're incredibly funny and you're handsome too. You know, I mean, literally. <laughs> and so, you know, no normal human being, not that I'm saying Putin is a normal human being, can withstand that, right? And he's clearly not a man who wants people to, you know, give him real advice or gainsay him in any way. Some of you may remember the video that was released a couple of days before the invasion in February, where he had a cabinet meeting, and um, you know all of his cabinet officials were supposed to you know s stand up and say their opinion and everything else, and he just bullied one of his most you know w one of his cabinet officials, and that was a t that was a video. It was taped, and then he chose to release it not only in Russia but to the world you know, sending us all a message that he controls all these people. And you can see these uh, other officials, you know, waiting for their turn and hoping that they too are not gonna be, that they're not gonna be humiliated in that same way. They were afraid of him. And so I think, you know, he's, I mean, you know, he has these intel officers, actually counter intel, which is, you know, its whole own breed, um, counter intel officers that all came up through the 80s, the 90s, 80s, you know, in, in, in the services, 90s in Petersburg, then they all came to Moscow, to the Kremlin. They've all been together for years, um, but they still apparently can't tell him the truth. And so I, I think that's part of it, that he has this view of history um, that's been encouraged by, by certain individuals, uh, and nobody's going to tell him, no, that's not the way it is. Turn it around. Um you knew when he campaigned, uh, Volodymyr Zelensky. Um, mm -hmm. He's been president for 22, uh, for, for three years now. He, uh, 
best known as a TV actor, by the way. You can now watch it on net Netflix as, mm -hmm. as TV And it's show. really funny. <laughs> uh, um, did you expect that President Zelensky would become the heroic leader of Ukraine in the way that he, he has, by, by all accounts? Yeah. I, I mean, I didn't. I didn't know what to expect. I mean, nobody did, because he is relatively untried as a politician and certainly had not been put in, in this position of war. I mean, few, few leaders um, have been, um, but I think it's been remarkable. I mean, he's been so courageous, and he has you know, united the Ukrainian people, inspired them, inspired the world, and so I think it's, it's, an, it's an amazing performance. And you know, when I say the word performance, um, I say it um, deliberately, because he is an actor. He's an actor, he's a singer, he is very talented. And um, I was in Ukraine in February before the war started, and um, one of his associates, former associates, said, what you need to understand about Zelensky is that he's always playing the movie in, you know, in his head. He's thinking about, what is this gonna look like? And, um, and so I, I guess one of the things I'm saying, and I'm not saying this as a criticism at all, but you know, what does a wartime leader look like? What do I need to do to inspire my people, fight back against Russia, and get support from the international community. And so I think he is channeling uh, his image of what a wartime hero should, should look, a leader hero should look like, and um, good for him because it's working. Um, and you know, I will tell you that, <laughs> yeah, I mean, exactly. I mean, he's really inspirational. Um, and I think, you know, on a lesser scale, we all do that. You know, when, when we have a crisis and we think, well, what would, you know, Evo Dalder, who I respect so much, what would he do in this um, situation? I mean, I, I would actively ask myself those questions when I was faced with, you know, nothing like this, of course, but with challenges. And so I think it's a legitimate way to go forward, and I think he's doing a fabulous job. He's, he certainly is. He's, he's putting uh, the West to shame and many others as well, but he's also uh, bringing his people together. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I guess the, uh, the other thing that seems surprising, not just Zelensky, but the people of Ukraine yeah. standing up in the way they have, and uh, so t it was that, has that been surprising to you? And separately, um, something I've been wondering about, how much does this assistance that the United States provided over the last eight years, including the time mm -hmm. you were there, military assistance, mm -hmm. the training, the, the kind of equipment, how much can that be part of the explanation? Or is it really all about the patriotism uh, that exists, or, or both, uh, mm -hmm. uh, within the people? How, can, how, how should we understand the unexpected resistance yeah. of Ukraine to the Russian, to the Russian so army? So I think, you know, for people like me, I mean, I've lived a total of six years now in, in Ukraine, and so I was not surprised at, at that they were fighting back, that they were united, that they were absolutely committed uh, to pushing back, you know, the invader. Um, and so I, I was not surprised. Um, you know, there is um, one of the most famous uh, Ukrainian poets, one of his lines is, fight on and you will prevail. And every Ukrainian school child knows that line. They, they, they know the whole poem, but they know that line too. So they're brought up on that. And I think you can see the results, not just in the military, not just in the territorial defense units, which were you know, set up on the fly, but in, you know, grandmothers putting together Molotov cocktails and, and, you know, just resisting and everybody jumping in and doing their part. If they don't fight, they drive an ambulance. If they don't drive an ambulance, they're cooking for the troops or for whoever needs help. Um, it, it's, it's really very, um, I think, inspirational. And um, I think part of it, um, I think a huge part of it is that X factor of will. You know, we cannot lose, and so we are going to win, and we're going to make it happen one way or the other, because this is an existential fight for the Ukrainians. They know, um, you know, once the Russians came across the border, which, you know, many, you know, believed, hoped, I don't know what the right verb is, would never happen, but once they crossed the border and started, um, started fighting the Ukrainians, the Ukrainians knew they had to prevail because otherwise they would be destroyed. And so they're fighting, you know, they're fighting for their country, but they're, fight, they're also fighting for their family and their freedom. And so they're not gonna give up. 
And I think that X factor of will is hugely important. But I also think that um, we can give ourselves and some of our um, allies um, you know, a hand because, I mean, first of all, we've been helping the Ukrainian military since, since independence. But there wasn't so much interest uh, really in joining NATO, in doing the reforms uh, that um, you know, modern militaries undertake, like establishing a non-commissioned officer corps so that you have a smaller, more flexible military so that um, you, you don't have to have your general officers on the spot, you know, giving directions on how to take the hill and like the Russians getting killed. I mean, it's, it's, it's absolutely astounding. The Russian military has never undergone those, those kinds of reforms. The Ukrainians weren't very interested in the early years but in 2014, they started becoming very interested. And so we had a pretty robust program of train and equip. And, um, and so it's exactly what it sounds like. We equipped the Ukrainian military and we trained them. Um, they, you know, they would go out to the front lines, they would come back, we would uh, you know, learn from them. Uh, so this was good for us too, because you know, this is the only military really that's engaging uh, with, uh, with the Russian military. And so we're finding out what their tactics and strategies and um, et cetera are. And, um, and then we would help them refine what they needed to do. So we provided a lot of training to a lot of different people. And I think especially in the early uh, weeks of the war, before we blew through <laughs> every you know, self-imposed barrier that we put, you know, uh, I mean, and what I mean by that is what we are providing the Ukrainians now, both in terms of the kind of equipment as well as the quantity, um, would have been inconceivable four months ago. Uh, and you know, we provided uh, them initially with all sorts of equipment, and every week we have given them more and more. And it's important we do so that they win. Because if Ukraine wins, in my opinion, the West wins because this is about more than just Ukraine. Putin does have an obsession uh, with Ukraine, as, as we've discussed, but it's also about, for him, um, you know, pushing back against the international rules-based order of creating a world you know, where he can't really compete, uh, creating a world where might makes right, and so the Russians or the Russian military can, can bully other countries into getting its way. That makes for a less secure world, not just for C Ukrainians or for people on uh, countries on the front line with Ukraine and Russia, um, but for all of us, less secure, less prosperous, prosperous, less free. And so we need to provide as much help as we can to the Ukrainians so they stop the Russians there, because, it will, because if they're not stopped there, they will continue. I mean, maybe they'll wait another eight years, but they will continue. How well do you think the Biden administration has handled the situation? I actually think they're doing a really good job. I, I do. <laughs> and I think it's not easy. Uh, it's not easy at all because uh, it's, um, President Biden is trying to navigate a very narrow channel uh, between supporting our allies on uh, the eastern flank, like Poland and others, trying to deter the Russians and, um, and now sort of, you know, punish them, and um, trying to provide as much support to Ukraine as possible, all while not um, expanding the war. I mean, that is a really tricky task. And I think we're fortunate that um, the administration has been really careful about this, the, because, you know, we're taking risks, right, in, uh, in terms of trying to provide or, or providing assistance to Ukraine. And, you know, Putin has put us on notice about all sorts of things we're doing, including in the beginning saying that economic sanctions was an act of war. So it's, it's risky what we're doing, but my view is that it's also risky not to do enough. And that's what's been happening over the last 20 years, where we, you know, <laughs> we sort of dipped our toe in and got a little bit stronger each time uh, there was a Russian invasion of yet another country. Um, but we, 
we weren't strong enough. Um, and of course, I was part of all of those um, uh, actions. And so, you know, I, I also acknowledge that. But I think that we need to make very clear to Moscow that it is not going to win this time, that, it's not, that this is not going to be tolerated, and that, you know, this has to be the end of this kind of behavior. And I think, you know, over the last several months, um, two months, we are seeing a toughening of our um, policy, not just in terms of the sanctions and the humanitarian and economic assistance, and crucially the security and intel assistance, but um, in terms of our rhetoric. And I'm thinking of you know Defense Secretary Austin right now, where he is really pushing the envelope on this. Before I go to question and answers, uh, to qu you do the question, uh, you do the <laughs> answers, and you do the questions. Before we go to the audience to ask you the questions, uh, one one final. Thing. I totally agree with you that Ukraine needs to win. What does that mean? I think, um, so that, that is a really good question. Um, and I, what, what it means to me, uh, which you know, may not be what it means to you or Biden or to, you know, most importantly, the Ukrainian people themselves. I mean, to me what it means is that Ukraine um, is in charge of itself. Ukraine has sovereignty, not only in terms of how it runs itself, its own country, but also in terms of its uh, alliances and um, and you know how, how it, it deals with uh, with other countries and that its borders are inviolate. So you know which borders? Because of course there was. Does that mean Crimea? Does that mean you know the old parts of the Donbas? Um, back in February, um, Putin and Russia um, sort of. Uh, uh, you know, recognized all of Luhansk and Donetsk, which they don't even control even now. So, <clears throat> I, I mean, I think there are a lot of questions there. And I think at the end of the day, it has to be not what I think or what, what you, we think here in the United States. It has to be what the Ukrainian people think. And, you know, Ukraine is a flawed country like every other country. <laughs> um, but I, I think that Zelensky has made that very clear when back when there were active negotiations with the Russians uh, about a month ago, he noted that um, whatever agreement is reached, uh, the Ukrainian people are going to have to approve it by referendum. And that's because Ukraine is a democracy. It's going to be up to the Ukrainian people with, you know, what, which borders are acceptable um, and what other kinds of um, provisions in you know, that eventual peace document, um, they are willing to live with. And, um, you know, and I, I, I think we should respect that, as I believe the Biden administration is. Yeah, and they certainly have suffered enough to make that decision yeah, themselves, exactly. absolutely. Um, it's time for, for the audience to get involved. Yeah. Uh, there, I think there's a microphone roaming around here. Uh, as, as you find someone, uh, uh, Josh, to give the microphone to, I want to ask uh, one of the questions that came in uh, during registration. Uh, uh, a bunch of them came in, but uh, this one in particular I thought was... And then, sorry to interrupt, real quick, I'm only one person. <laughs> and you are many. So I'm going to try and get as much of a geographic uh, dispersion as I can. So uh, please be patient and we are have a little bit of time for questions. Not all day, so we're going to get to as many as we can. Thank you. So here's the first one, and then Josh finds the, 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 the first uh, person to ask a very brief question. Um, from Anonymous, why is Putin so interested in Ukraine? Why isn't he just satisfied with Russia? What does he want from Ukraine? Yeah, well, that is a very good question. Um, I, I, I think what he wants to do is um, secure his legacy of being the man who gathered there's a saying in Russian of gathering up the lands. And I think he wants to gather up the lands, bring them back to the bosom of Mother Russia, Ukraine being the most important country. And um, so whether it's re reinventing the Soviet Union, reinventing the Russian Empire, I think that's what it's about. But I also think that if you look back at um, you know, Putin's um, political trajectory, uh, the Second Chechen War and all its brutality, that rocketed it into the presidency of Russia the first time. Um, back in 2014, when he took Crimea, basically without a shot, um, he was super popular in the 70s. And uh, again, he, he, um, he became the president of Russia again. 
and he has elections coming up in 2024, uh, and I think he thought that this was going to be a cakewalk. He was going to waltz, uh, his troops were going to waltz into Kiev. He could come down as the conqueror, the liberator, you know, reuniting <clears throat> Ukrainians and Russians, whatever the myth was, and, um, and secure that next presidential election. Okay, yeah, Go ahead. to your right. Um, oh, okay. yeah. um, so thank you. It's been a real privilege to listen to you guys talk. Um, my question is, so Ru this, Russia hasn't officially uh, declared war on Ukraine yet. It's a military <clears throat> operation to denazify it, which is insane. But um, if they do officially do it, how much do you think us and our allies will ramp up support and what do you think like a post-russian economy looks like a, a post-russian a, a post like war russian economy like what do you think their economy will look like after this conflict yeah um so i i think what we are seeing is a ramping up of our assistance basically every week right i mean i think president biden yesterday announced yet another tranche of uh, security assistance to to the ukrainians and so i i i, I don't see that ending anytime soon because I think it's necessary and I think the, the administration understands the stakes, not just for Ukraine, but for us. Um, so I would anticipate that that would continue. The Russian economy, I mean, yeah, this is one of the tragedies of, of this. It, it, it's, it's, Putin's war of choice is not um, only, uh, I don't want to say destroying Ukraine because I believe that Ukraine will ultimately prevail. Um, and rebuild, and you know, even better than before. But I, um, it is doing grave harm, obviously, to the Ukrainian people <clears throat> and to Ukraine itself. Um, but ironically, this war of choice is destroying Russia. It's destroying its standing in the world. It's destroying its economy. I mean, you can see, you know, if, if what he wants is to recreate the Soviet Union, he's doing that. I mean, there are lines for, you know, ATM machines. There are lines for basic commodities and um, talon, you know, coupons, uh, which, you know, when issues during wartime, even though there is no war, um, they're issuing coupons for certain kinds of, um, you know, staples because they're not readily available. Uh, and so I, I was... Uh, you know, I mean, nobody knows how much the uh, Russian economy is going to drop, but, you know, up to 10% just this year. And then just a steady 1% to 2% shrinkage every year. I mean, this is devastating. Uh, and, you know, I, I wish I could say that I thought that the war would end, you know, in two months. I think it's going to go on for a long time. And, you know, Putin having to finance his his military um, is also going to uh, drain uh, drain his his budget and um, ultimately at some point he is going to run out of out of dollars too so I think all, all in all it's devastating for the Russian economy now and it will be in the future because not all of the sanctions have kicked in and we are laying on even more and here in the back to your right right back here if you can see me can you stand up please? Oh. Hi. I, I think you are a hero. Um, Thank you. As an American, it's really important, I think, to show that you believe in the rule of law and you believe in what I, I grew up thinking of as American ideals, which I think you really just showed incredible courage at Trump's impeachment and testifying. I just, thank you. Thank My question. <laughs> thank you. My question to you is, as Americans who love our country, how do we stop our beloved democracy from f sliding into autocracy? Yeah. So um, that is, <laughs> first of all, thank you for, um, for your kind words. Um, and secondly, thank you for the question, because I think it is the question we should all be asking ourselves, because clearly we have challenges in the United States today. And um, I, I wish I had a great answer for you, but I think, I, I think the, the answer is that 
we all need to be playing our part, what, whatever that is. You know, so some people, um, you know, uh, become lawyers and join the Justice Department and do important work there. Other people work in their in their communities and try to strengthen, you know, the school board or uh, work on. Um, you know, some sort of civic project. And I think sometimes we work with people in those non-controversial um, issues, shall we say? Like, I'm hoping that planting, <laughs> planting trees and stuff isn't controversial. Um, and with people that we maybe don't agree with politically. But, you know, building those bridges with people that uh, we don't agree with, I think is kind of essential. And we seem to have all lost that sense of community and, um, you know, we're, in, in terms of how we get the news, or where we worship, or uh, even sometimes where we work, we are just in our little silos, and we don't hear anything different. We don't meet people who uh, who disagree with us. I mean, obviously, I'm grossly gener generalizing here, but you know, trying to build those bridges, be becoming civically involved, and becoming politically involved. People need to vote. Uh, I mean, and there's somebody here who has a voting mask on. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, this is like the very most basic thing of our civic responsibility, in my view, and, and yet we can't even get people to the polls. And I will tell you, having served most of my career overseas, people in, 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 in the former Soviet Union, I mean, we, we look at ourselves as a big democracy, they are shocked that we don't vote. And um, I think, you know, we need to vote. So that's kind of a, a, a short answer, but I think that we, need to not take our institutions um, and our rights and responsibilities for granted. We need to put in the work uh, to you know, tend and defend our democracy. Because, um, and, and I'll tell you that, um, so I spent, as I said, most of my career overseas uh, and was always so proud of you know, our institutions and would tell people in developing countries, mostly in the former Soviet Union, that that's what it was about, you know, building those strong institutions, uh, which is true. But when I came back to the United States, what I realized with the attacks on many of our institutions, including the State Department, that it also required, um, frankly, and this is not very sexy, a strong personnel policy. <laughs> so, so that you have strong ethical people uh, not only in charge, but all the way up the chain, that they are mentored into doing the right things, the little things in the beginning, because that builds you know, that, that muscle of integrity so that when there are harder choices along the way, people will, will do the right thing. They won't be silenced, they won't be cowed. And um, I, 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 you know, I, I feel that we do have strong institutions, and I thought that that was enough. But it turns out our institutions need our people just as much as we need our institutions. Straight back here on, slightly on your left. Do you think that Putin has to respond to the Russian public? Um, thank you very much for the question. I. Um, I think that even in authoritarian states, there is some necessity for leaders to respond to their publics. And especially, you know, we were talking about the economy before, especially if, you know, that starts really biting uh, ordinary people and, and there is a level of, of, of dissatisfaction. But here's the thing, I mean, the uh, Russian government, Putin himself, they are masters at disinformation, and they don't only target us, <laughs> you know, they target their own people. And so there is this whole myth about the, you know, the heroic Russian military that is going to help the Ukrainians and liberating them from the Nazis and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and people are buying that because that is what, that's all they're, that's the information they're getting. And um, then when the body bags come home, uh, not necessarily to Moscow and Petersburg, the elite Russian cities, but you know, to, to the, um, the little villages far, far away um, that are less sophisticated, shall we say. And you know, the, um, they are being told that their sons, their husbands, their fathers, that they are heroes because they were, they were defending Russia against the Nazis. So um, I think that while 
Putin does have to um, satisfy to some level his own people, Russia is not a democracy and um, there is no accountability for him. And if he's not able to um, accommodate the people's desires, I mean, he will put them in jail. I mean, as we are seeing when, with the protests on the street, he will just put them in jail um, and repress them. Thank you, Ambassador Jovanovic. Thank you. You might recognize me. We met twice in Kharkiv when you were ambassador. So I am the see German you. Consul General here in Chicago, and before I was the German Consul General in Dnipropetrovsk. Oh, so we met so twice during your <laughs> that is tenure so great to see in Kharkiv. Uh, so my question re refers to my the previous area that I represented, which is Eastern Ukraine. Uh, the devastation in cities like Kharkiv and yeah. Mariupol. Yeah. Uh, how much do you think it has to do not only with strategical reasons that these cities have kind of are standing in his way, but they also already stood in his way in 2014 when he had his first advance and particularly Kharkiv disappointed him in the way that it didn't go along with him, yeah. Mariupol as well. How much do you think this is more than just the strategical necessity to conquer these cities, but also a kind of feeling of revenge hmm, to destroy these cities, to tell them a, a lesson, yeah. and to tell the whole Ukrainian country a lesson. And of course, I mean, uh, I know many people still in these cities, and yeah. I don't know what they are doing now at the moment. It's, it's a devastating situation, particular in the areas where the people speak Russian. Yeah. So to say, I defend the Russian speakers by killing them, and devastating, especially those cities who stood up against his first yeah. invasion into Russia. So what, what, how, how do you assess this particular brutality against these cities? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I mean, I hadn't thought of that before, but I mean, you make a good point. Um, I mean, certainly they, they fought back and, and um, the, the Russian proxies were, were not successful in those two cities. Um, again, making, you know, it, it just shows what good leadership can do because, I mean, you and I can both tell folks that the individuals who rallied their people to fight back against the Russian proxies. Um, so leadership really does make a difference. But um, I, I think the other element of this is that um, it, it, it's terror. I mean, the Russians want to terrorize the Ukrainian people and break their will. Uh, and they haven't been successful in doing so. And in fact, when um, the Ukrainian people found out uh, the, about the atrocities in Bucha and of course the endless saga in Mariupol, it has only hardened the will of the Ukrainian people. Um, but I think it is to terrorize and, and break the will of the Ukrainian people so that they ask you know, the military, Zelensky, to stop. I think that is part of the Russian strategy. And again, um, you know, uh, they are paying a huge price in blood, the Ukrainian people, and I, you know, I don't, one never knows how, how much one can withstand, but again, I think it demonstrates that Putin just does not understand the Ukrainian people. Thank you. It's nice we, to see you again. We have just time for two more, so I'm really sorry, but I'm trying to do what I can. Please stand up. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for your service. I have two questions. Um, how much do you think um, former President Trump's denigration of NATO led to Putin's feeling he could do this without being punished by the world or by, by NATO? And two, how much do you think we have to worry about Putin using nuclear weapons? So I, I, I do think that um, you know Putin took a lot of uh, satisfaction and succor in um, President Trump, President Trump's um, kind of toadying up to uh, to to the Russian president, uh, and you know John Bolton has said that if um, if President Trump had won his second term, that he would have pulled the U.S. out of NATO, which would have meant you know the end of NATO, basically. So I think you know that was all very pleasing uh, to Vladimir Putin. And I think he saw, as you said, that what he believed to be a weak and um, uh, ununited NATO that was never going to be able to come together and, and push back in the way that we are seeing now. 
Uh, and so I think, you know, Putin famously has made three miscalculations. He didn't understand the Ukrainian people. He didn't know <laughs> how weak his own military is. And he didn't understand that the West under US leadership actually could and would rally together uh, to, you know, to, to push back. Uh, in terms of nuclear weapons, um, I mean, obviously this is a very frightening thing and I think we need to take, um, take this very seriously. Um, I mean, I take some comfort in that, um, you know, our own military says that they are not seeing the kinds of movements that they would expect if the, if the Russians were actually going to use um, nuclear uh, weapons. Uh, and I think, you know, the Russians, you know, they're, they're talking a lot. Um, Putin's talking, Lavrov is talking, um, threatening, you know, saying they're not threatening, et cetera, et cetera. They're trying to deter us. And we need to take it seriously, but we also can't, um, can't succumb because um, we need to be strong in this instance because if we aren't um, and you can't, Ukraine fails, Putin will keep on going, and and things will just get worse. So we need to we, we need to be I think very resolute in in all this. I don't know if you want to add something on this because you probably know more about it than I do. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I pay him to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I do. Okay, we just have time for one more straight in the back here. Thank you so much. I want to thank you truly for the remarkable work that you do, especially in Ukraine. Duže děkuji vám. And as a Ukrainian, I have a lot of questions, but I'm just going to ask one, which I think not, I mean, it's not a priority probably right now, but it needs to be, people need to talk about it and know that it's happening. And it's about robbery uh, of Ukrainian history and Ukrainian pieces of art. Mm. It's been done for many years and uh, nothing that was stolen um, during the Soviet time was ever returned to Ukraine. Half of museums in St. Petersburg and Moscow are filled with you know, pieces from Ukraine, from the south and from Kiev, from western part. And it's happening again. So they are stealing from museums. They are destroying, specifically targeting. Just this morning, a museum in Kharkiv of a famous Ukrainian philosopher was bombed and destroyed. So do you think after Ukrainian victory, is there a hope for Ukrainian people to get the, you know, s at least some of the significant pieces back and how involved international community needs to be? And, uh, you know, if there is something that Ukrainian people can do or, you know, um, how can we bring more attention to this problem and what, what is there a chance for us to ever yeah. get anything back? Yeah, well, I certainly hope so. I mean, I, I, I think, you know, I, I hope that there will be accountability for the war crimes that have been committed. You know, not only the torture and murder, um, but the deportation of peoples to, to Russia against their will. Uh, and I think an important part of what Russia is doing to try to destroy the Ukrainian people is to destroy the culture. Uh, and I think, you know, the Soviets did that before, and um, we are seeing a continuation of, uh, of that. And I think that, you know, holding Russia accountable is important not only um, uh, to, um, to deliver justice to the Ukrainian people, uh, and really to the world, um, but but also to act as hopefully a deterrent to other would-be dictators out there who say, oh, you know, Putin wasn't held to account, Russia wasn't held to account, I can do this. Yeah, they'll be mad at me for a year or two, but then it's gonna go away and you know, I'll be back in the family of nations again. We need to hold uh, dictators, authoritarian leaders, um, countries that are um, you know, performing these bar bar barbarous acts to account. I mean, that is, um, we are now in the year 2022, and I, I think probably all of us are, have said at one point or another about this war of choice, how can we be here? How could this actually be happening in 2022? So we need to make sure that this is the last time. Ladies and gentlemen. Uh, buy the book. It's a and over there. <laughs> because you. it thank goes so into much. great m more detail, but more importantly, uh, please join me in, in thanking you for, for everything you did today, your service. <laughs> Terrific. Thanks so Thanks much. A lot.